with the country's biggest river about to overflow with insane rain getting the Mississippi to levels it hasn't seen in more than 50 years. Water spilling out into towns from the Midwest to the Gulf. We'll take you live to Iowa where the flooding could be the worst it's been since the Beatles had the biggest song in the country. Plus, the message from President Biden tonight is clear. He wants to finish the job, rolling out a new video to announce his re-election push. But what do voters think of his announcement? We've got our teams fanned out across the country with an answer. And dramatic protests after Montana's first openly transgender lawmaker says she was silenced by Republicans, refusing to let her speak on bills that would restrict the rights of trans people. We'll show you the tense moments and how the GOP there is responding. Plus, remember that SpaceX explosion that Elon Musk said was supposed to happen? Turns out it's created a health problem, a big one, experts say, in Texas, with all that debris getting everywhere, why the FAA is now grounding Musk and SpaceX all together. Plus, could somebody please pass the Kleenex because it's allergy season and it's getting worse, including for, for people who never had allergies before until now? Why this year seems to be such a beast a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we'll get to those floods in a second. But we want to start with, in the next couple of hours, the plans for President Biden to meet with South Korea's president just after telling Americans he wants another four years in the White House. Yes, he is officially launching his re-election campaign after months of speculation. We have just learned in the last couple of seconds that he's hopped on a call with about a dozen Democratic governors today to talk messaging, right? It is part of his broader push here heading into 2024. But his message to voters? Finish the job. The union folks he spoke with today seem to like that line. Watch. Four more years! Four more years! Four more years! Four more years, they're saying. Well, President Biden hopes so, as he's making very clear in this three-minute-long video, you're seeing some of it here, officially announcing his re-election run. It was talking about this theme of personal freedom, asking people if they want more or fewer rights, going after so-called MAGA extremists and the kind of founding father of the MAGA movement, Donald Trump. Our Shaq Brewster caught up with voters in a deep blue part of Wisconsin, a key state, to get a vibe check on how this thing went down. Watch. I think he's a good candidate to probably go up against Trump. He doesn't really keep the promises, to especially the younger generation. Well, I don't mind him, his age, though it does... And pose some problems, maybe. We don't know. Interesting there. Kayla Talshay is outside the White House. We'll get to the age factor in a second, Kayla. But broadly speaking, you've got second verse, sort of same as the first year for President Biden. You see the side by side. He started his 2020 campaign with images from that Charlottesville white supremacist rally. Now he's starting this video with the attack on the Capitol, focusing on this idea of freedom, taking after what he and his team have long called MAGA extremists. Talk about how he's laying out that roadmap and the strategy for the sort of fledgling Biden campaign to push back on what is a key issue for him, as you just heard that voter lay out with Shaq, and that is the fact that he would be 82 years old on Inauguration Day. Yeah, he's billing this as a an, an election that essentially boils down to the most fundamental values of this nation, saying that it's a choice between the party of Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, or the party of himself, Kamala Harris, and everyday Americans. And it's that latter path that he says is the path toward freedom of equality, expression of democratic values, and of a whole host of other things. And so clearly he's trying to double down on this stark contrast that he has built between Democrats and Republicans. Remember, White House aides helped hone that message ahead of the 2022 midterms, which by and large were more successful for Democrats than originally expected. And so the president is doubling down on that and establishing once again that contrast between the views of Republicans and Democrats on a whole host of issues like abortion, uh, gun control, and, uh, you know, certain transgender issues. And so you could expect to see a lot of that in the president's policy platform once it gets built for this second term campaign. You've got the pushback from the Republican National Committee today, right, calling him, and again, very 2021 themes here, saying, okay, President Biden is out of touch. They say he's created crisis after crisis, et cetera. They're also using AI, right, to create these hypothetical what-if scenarios, kind of apocalyptic, like what could happen if President Biden were to be reelected? I want to play a little bit of that. 
This just in, we can now call the 2024 presidential race for Joe Biden. So again, what if you were reelected? There's some pushback from Democrats who were saying, hey, why create these hypotheticals here? Does it show that the RNC doesn't have much to lean on? The president himself has leaned into some of the issues that were laid out in that ad, right? Um, the idea of some of these culture war issues. Talk us through that. Well, I thought the culture war issue was especially notable, Hallie, because President Biden has, has, has had a longstanding strategy of trying to be above the fray, trying to uh, be the neutralizer, to take down the temperature of the national conversation. At least that was the, mo the method uh, and the mood of his 2020 campaign. But now he's really uh, trying to get in touch with these lightning rods for voters, especially as the electorate suffers from voter apathy, which is a real issue. So he's showing a lot of frames in this re-election launch video of, you know, uh, abortion rights with some polls showing as many as six in 10 voters supporting abortion, at least in some, if not all cases. And so he's showing that he's showing multiple frames of the liberal Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, who he nominated and had confirmed through the through the Senate. He's talking about cuts to Social Security, uh, attacks on women's health care and voting rights. And he talked a little bit about that in a speech that he delivered to union members today. And so he's leaning into some of these issues as galvanizing issues for the electorate, even as the last time around he stayed away from those. But clearly he's found them and the Democratic Party has found them to be winning issues. Kayla Tausche, live for us outside the White House. Uh, much more I know to be talking about in the weeks and months and days to come. Thank you. So listen, dozens of towns are bracing what could, for what could be some of the worst flooding they have ever seen. And it's not just the rain, right? The focus is on the Mississippi River, expected to inch up toward record high levels. You see it here, like it's right under that highway in Minnesota. It's been getting closer and closer to the road. It's spilled over in some spots. Look at the riverfront in downtown Davenport. It is just covered in water. It looks like an outdoor theater there. You can see how high the water levels are. Remember, this is a river that stretches from Louisiana all the way up to Minnesota, and it's the part up north that is the biggest concern now with the flood watch down through Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois to Missouri. In some areas, you could see the river rise to the highest it's been since the Sound of Music premiered 1965. Just take a look. This is a yacht club outside St. Paul, Minnesota. It is almost totally underwater. The water's up almost to those windows there. And the flood risk runs all the way to California, too, out west, for a different reason. As it gets warmer, that record-setting snowpack in the Sierra, we told you about all winter, it'll start melting. Yosemite already has a flood watch starting Thursday. Our Maggie Vespa just got to her location, like in the last 25 seconds or so, Maggie, after working your way through traffic that's already happening because of the flooding in Davenport, Iowa. Talk to us about what you've seen. Yeah, I mean, Hallie, this road behind us is closed. That's been closed since this morning. But just this afternoon, several roads we found out just in the last few minutes were also closed. People are really preparing here, and they're used to flooding. Like, this is an area along the Mississippi River, which floods from time to time. But they're taking this one really seriously, because in some areas, this could be the worst flooding that they've seen in 20 years, if not more. You can see people uh, behind us feverishly building sandbags. The city also Earlier today, the city's mayor showing us this massive wall of sand, like sand-filled blocks that they have um, kind of up against the river's banks. And they say they only pull that out for really the most extreme floods. I'm going to step out of the way so you can see what those guys are doing. They've been working on that since this morning. Basically, Hallie, some of these areas, as you said, kind of to the north, already really threatened, starting to see the worst of it, because this is not about a rain system moving in and dumping rain. This is about, and we've talked about this with our climate unit, this is about snowpack melting off in North Dakota and northern Minnesota, up to 18 inches in some places. Those areas got hammered this winter, and now it's really warm. All that snow is melting off and slowly flooding the Mississippi, making its way on down among all of these banks. Well, and these communities are really kind of getting hit one by one, Hallie. Yeah, and we're seeing some of these, these um, images, Maggie, like people trying to move in different blocks to try to keep the water from, from overflowing. There's only so right. much you can do in the face of Mother Nature, right? Like there's only so many sandbags you can put up in the face of some of this stuff here. Yeah. No, exactly. And actually, uh, kind of the sand wall that they're using here in Davenport is, they say, pulled from military design that's been used on military bases um, overseas in the Middle East during conflicts. They are really pulling out all the stops, and they haven't done this since 2019 when they had a massive flood um, where the water stayed at its crest 
for several weeks, which is what they're kind of afraid of here. Officials in multiple states, including the governor of Iowa and just late today, the governor of Mississippi, really, or excuse me, of Minnesota, uh, really encouraging people along the Mississippi River to build a plan. They have a four-stage plan. We want to show you kind of what they're laying out. They say, first, have your exit, have your evacuation plan. Second, they say, pack your emergency kit which is something that means that you should be ready to leave your home for days. We are talking yeah. about clothes, toiletries, medications, all of that. Be ready to be gone for a long time. I say stay informed about the forecast as well. And then really follow the information and the alerts from all of your local officials, your local authorities, because this will be encroaching for several days. Where we are, Iowa and Illinois, a bit farther south, they're saying this may not crest until early next week. And after that, people here worry, again, it could stay crested, Hallie for days, if not weeks, longer. So this could be yeah, a long battle, could, Hallie. I was just going to say, this could stretch for a bit. Maggie Vespa, live for us in Davenport. Glad you made it there. Uh, Maggie, thank you so much. In New York now, for former President Trump, it is not a political fight, but a legal battle taking center stage today in a civil trial over rape allegations. Mr. Trump's defense attorney, in his opening statement late today, saying there's a time and a place to hate Donald Trump, but that place is not in a court of law. Telling jurors the evidence will show the former president is not guilty. You see Mr. Trump's legal team arriving at the courthouse in New York earlier today. Photographers scrambling to get that shot. You're also going to see, here she is, former advice columnist E. Jean Carroll and her team. Carroll says the former president raped her nearly 30 years ago in a department store dressing room, which Mr. Trump denies. Her lawyer telling jurors Carroll blamed herself for what happened, which is why she didn't come forward sooner. Now... She says her client just wants her life back after the former president, and I'm quoting here, branded her a liar and a fraud. It is one of multiple legal issues that the former president and, by the way, current presidential candidate, of course, now faces. Ali Vitali is joining us now. This is just, and we laid it out there, one piece in what is a web of legal issues for Mr. Trump, who may very well, if polls now hold a year from now, be the Republican nominee who goes up against President Biden in 2024. Typically, if you were to hear the name of a potential candidate for president, in the same sentence as, you know, rape trial, allegations against them, et cetera, which he denies, um, it could be a game changer. That is not the case for Donald Trump. Well, think about this, Hallie. You and I were covering multiple credible allegations of sexual harassment, misconduct, and even assault back at the end of 2016, right before Election Day. This is a news cycle that we have done so many times already that voters are numb to it. This is not when I talk to voters about the legal trials facing the former president. This is not something that ever comes up, which I think is stunning to think about the fact that the electorate has sort of internalized that these are the kinds of claims made against Trump that even if he denies them, they've happened enough times that voters say they're not interested in adjudicating them, even if it's going through court right now. Again, there are other things that voters describe to me as baggage that could stray their support from Trump. This case is not one of those things. It, as we talk about Republicans in this race, it's not just Donald Trump. You have his competitors and potential competitors on the Republican side spread out across the globe. You are simply across the river from me in Arlington, Virginia, but that's because yes. that is where former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley has been, giving what her campaign called a big policy speech on abortion access. You've got Ron DeSantis overseas as he's trying to step out onto the international stage. Even though Donald Trump is taking up so much of the oxygen right now, got what we've seen was a kind of, frankly, indictment bump in polls inside the Republican Party, solidifying GOP support behind him, there are others who hope this to strip the mantle from him. Right. They're trying, at least. In Nikki Haley's case, it's as an official candidate. As In Ron DeSantis's case, it's as potentially a candidate sometime in the next few weeks. But look, for Haley, she came really to one of the mainstay anti-abortion group's headquarters here today to make a speech that allowed her to take the issue on directly, as opposed to some of her Republican rivals who have struggled with questions that they've been asked about their stances on abortion access. For Haley, today was more about talking about this as a different potential potentially more compassionate and consensus-building messenger. She is, of course, the only woman in the field, and so she was able to give a more personal view to why she is uh, anti-abortion and why she wants to see anti-abortion legislation taken up around the country. But she similarly struggled around the specifics, not giving her mile marker on what number of weeks she think is the appropriate level for a federal ban, but also saying that she appreciates that the court sent this back to the states. And so those two things 
things are in tension, a federal role and states being able to make their own decisions, Republicans across the board are going to have to reconcile the way that they talk about this. But from Haley's perspective, she took on things that she says are nationally points of consensus. For example, these things. Watch. We should be able to agree that contraception should be more available, not less. And we can all agree that women who get abortions should not be jailed. A few have even called for the death penalty. That's the least pro-life position I can possibly imagine. And look, Hallie, when we talk about the fact that Republicans are in many ways out of step with the majority of Americans who want abortion to be legal in all or most cases, the positions that Haley laid out there are things that have national consensus around them. And that's what she's saying she would push for if she were elected president. Ali Vitale, live for us in Arlington, Virginia, covering all things GOP in this race. Appreciate it. To Capitol Hill and an eye-popping plan tonight with senators from both sides of the aisle about to roll out a bill that would make using social media illegal for kids under the age of 13. It would make it against the law for those kids, tweens, let's call them, to use, you know, Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. Kids 13 to 17 would need permission from parents, and the bill would restrict some of the algorithms that social media companies use that target minors. This is one piece of a bigger push by state and local and federal officials to limit how and when kids can get online and onto social media. You've got new laws in Arkansas and Utah that already require a parent's permission before kids can sign up for these platforms. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, they already say you have to be 13 to use this stuff, but you know kids have certainly found ways to get online and on these platforms before then. NBC's Jake Ward is covering this for us. It is, um, we talk a lot about the way that Capitol Hill lawmakers want to try to regulate social media, specifically when it comes to kids. This has been a push for years now, but this is a new twist on the plan, right? Like making it illegal for 12 and under to be on something like TikTok or, TikTok or Snapchat. Talk us through some of the dynamics That's here, right. Jake. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I think, you know, until now, Hallie, we really relied on the tech industry itself to, in theory, police this issue. And that is why we have this uh, 13-year-old standard that has been the standard across the tech industry. I think it's important to point out that science is very much uh, not in support of the idea that 13 is somehow a safe age at which uh, social media uh, can be used. But we seem to see uh, lawmakers sort of, you know, realizing at this point that these companies cannot necessarily police themselves. I mean, you know, when back when we had uh, those big leaks that came out of uh, Meta, out of Facebook, uh, you know, back at that time, it was clear that uh, that company was talking internally about the need to bring on as many kids as possible to replace uh, users that were uh, disappearing from the platform. We know that these companies really, really want young people to get acclimated to using social media. At the same time, Lawmakers are starting to hear from experts who have told them that the country is in the grip of a mental health crisis, especially when it comes to kids. I mean, the numbers are extraordinary, and the connection between the use of social media, the use of screens, and the use of this stuff has been very strong for a long time, Hallie. How, but, like, you talk about the enforcement issue, right? Like, and you said, and we know that Facebook and some of these platforms say you have to be 13 and over. How are lawmakers going to know if parents are letting their kids under the age of 13 get on these platforms? Or is this more about incentivizing parents to be able to say no and pointing to, let's say, a law, if it passes on Capitol Hill, that would stop that? Well, I think it could very much have both effects. I think it's really important to note that lawmakers are increasingly realizing that it's not up to them to figure out the technical specifics of how a company is going to comply with things, right? The Montana ah. TikTok ban that's under consideration right. right now does not put it on lawmakers to figure out how that would work, puts it on TikTok to figure out how that would work. In this case, it's very much on the platforms to figure that stuff out. That seems to be the emphasis here, Hallie. How much, you know, I wonder how much of an issue this is, because I will tell you, my kid, just anecdotally, my kid is three. I'm not worried about her getting on social media just yet. That'll be something I'll worry about in the years to come. But I'm thinking in my head, and maybe people think this who are like around my, my age, like, do 10 year olds care? Like, do they want to get online? Do they want to get on TikTok and Snapchat? Anecdotally, I have heard from parents who say, uh, hell yes, my 10 year old wants to get on this at 11, 12. Like, that is the age where they want to start doing this. How much of an issue is this, right? And, like, what are we seeing? Do we have some numbers to back this up? 
Well, we absolutely know that the science shows that there is an absolute correlation here between using this stuff and distraction from schoolwork, disruption of sleep cycles, the rise of mental health issues. That stuff is pretty well established. Is it causative? We don't know yet, but the correlation, the fact that these things are happening together, that's really strong at this point, Hallie. Jake Ward, uh, really interesting stuff. We're going to see how this goes when it gets rolled out officially uh, in the days to come. Appreciate it. A dramatic warning today about the risk of biohazards getting loose in Sudan after fighters took control of a lab there that contains some very dangerous and very contagious diseases. We're talking stuff like measles, polio, cholera. Lab techs can't even get in to secure this stuff because of all the fighting that's happening in the area. The WHO sounding the alarm tonight won't say which side has captured this lab, the army or the paramilitary rapid support forces. It's happening as the world is holding its breath in the middle of a very fragile 72-hour ceasefire, which has already been punctured by moments of violence. Courtney Kuby is joining us now. This lab situation is potentially very scary, uh, Court. Give us, like, the, the gut check on how concerned we should be, what's being done about it, what the temperature check is there at the Pentagon. It, there's a lot of concern about it. I mean, th about it, Hallie. There's, this is no joke. So it's things like polio, like measles. There are a couple of a couple of things that people, officials here and in the administration, are are, are very worried about. This number one, one you just said in the intro, they aren't saying who is in control of this lab now. We don't know which side is actually there, and we, but we know who, whoever the fighters were that went in, they kicked the technicians out. So the concern mm. is that some of these, these viruses and some of these contaminants, they may not be handled properly by these fighters who were in there. The other concern is just the overall security situation that exists in Khartoum right now in Sudan. It is so volatile that if one, if this location were to be hit or to come under fire, if there was some sort of a, a vulnerability to it, well, now there's no technicians there to theoretically keep these samples safe. So there's a lot of concern about this right now, Hallie. Do, you, you talked about how we don't know which side, right? Does it matter which side? In other words, if it's the army or if it's the paramilitary force, like, are, is one option better than the other, or is it just bad, period, that these lab techs can't get in to secure this, these uh, contagious viruses? So if it was the Army side, the more official Sudanese side, then, then the U.S. has some this could have talks with them. So that might be more positive, but the reality is either side being in charge without offic officials who know these, these um, yeah. pathogens is dangerous. Um, Quick update on this ceasefire, right? I mean, we've seen it. We've seen some of these moments of violence. We know that there are, like, th talks about evacuations for the Americans left in Sudan happening. What's the status update? That's right. So there is still hope that maybe this one will hold. There's, it's, there has been some violence, but it seems that it might be slowing down a little bit. There's some optimism there. And that's because the hope is that if the violence quiets at all, then it might be an opportunity to get more civilians and more government officials from other countries out of the, the, that country, out of Khartoum specifically. We heard a little bit about that from the State Department today, about why this ceasefire is so important. Here's what they had to say. We think that a ceasefire uh, is uh, really important to not just uh, to be representative of the will of the Sudanese people, but for uh, allowing the access of humanitarian aid uh, and for the appropriate next steps to take place for us to get this from a ceasefire to a specific uh, cessation of hostilities uh, between these two generals. So what we just heard there is sort of the carrot of what the international community right. is saying to Sudan is you want so you want to get some humanitarian aid which is more and more critical every day there then you need to agree to the ceasefire and we'll be able to get things in safely that's the hope here is that that's why what both sides may actually agree to is because they they need help Courtney QB uh, juggling a lot there tonight at the Pentagon court thank you coming up the family of Cash App founder Bob Lee coming face to face with his alleged killer today what we are learning from court in San Francisco Plus, a former Fox News producer who accused Tucker Carlson of promoting a hostile work environment, speaking now for the first time since he got the boot from the network. Her reaction to all of this, next. The family of the murdered Cash App founder in court in San Francisco today, facing his alleged killer with arraignment now delayed for a second time. The lawyer for suspect Nima Momeni asking to postpone for a week because she says she didn't get proper discovery documents for the case. But she did preview what her client will say when the arraignment does happen. A plea isn't an argument. A plea is a plea. And the plea is going to be not guilty. Momeni is accused of killing Bob Lee. 
with more than 20 members of Lee's family in court today, including his children. Some of Momeni's relatives were also in court, but not his sister, who prosecutors say was at the center of an argument between Lee and Momeni on the night of Lee's murder. Nayala Charles is joining us now. Um, so this arraignment has now been pushed back here. Obviously, some pretty notable moments in court with both families sort of sitting in the room here. Talk us through what we know. Well, Hallie, Momeni faces life in prison if he's convicted on this murder charge. Uh, Earlier, to, earlier, this is the second time now that the arraignment has been pushed, and that's because the first time his defense attorney was on vacation, and now she's saying, like you mentioned, she doesn't have all the discovery here. Essentially, what that is are the investigation reports. So this is what she's saying. She's blaming the San Francisco Police Department. Take a listen. To do my job effectively, I need the police reports. It's like, that's why I said that sort of thing. Like, it's not rocket science. If the police are going to make an arrest, they are duty bound to make these materials available to defense counsel. There's, it's not the appropriate discovery. I mean, there's some, a bunch of videos and stuff, but that's not what the appropriate discovery is. She's also saying she doesn't have the autopsy report, Hallie, but this is what the district attorney is saying in response, pushing back on her claims that she doesn't have all of the materials here. Take a listen. We've handed over substantial amounts of evidence to her, including uh, hours and hours of raw video footage, um, p numerous police reports, um, a DNA report, CSI report. Um, she, in my opinion, has sufficient evidence uh, evidence in this case to be able to enter a plea of not guilty on behalf of her client. Police say it's still an open investigation next week when the arraignment is set. Uh, Momeni's defense attorney says he'll be entering a not guilty plea and she'll be requesting that he be released on bond while prosecutors will be arguing that he not get a bond. Hallie? We're also learning more now about the relationship between Momeni, his sister and Bob Lee. Help us connect the dots. Yeah, so the district attorney says the main focus of this case will be the relationship, the nature of the relationship between Bob Lee and the defendant's sister, Kazar Momeni. Kazar is uh, the defendant's younger sister. She's married to a prominent plastic surgeon. She did uh, go to court the first court hearing a couple of weeks ago, but she was not seen in court today. The main thing here is the confrontation between Bob Lee and N Nima Momeni. The night of the murder, court documents say Nima Momeni confronted Bob Lee about a prior, conf a, prior uh, a prior confrontation he had with his sister, asking if she had did drugs or if they had uh, done anything inappropriate at a gathering they had been at before. After that, prosecutors say Nima Momeni took Bob Lee to a secluded area in downtown San Francisco before stabbing him three times with a kitchen knife. And another thing here that prosecutors are pointing at is what they say is the final text message that Bob Lee received from Kazar Momeni. They say in that text message, it referred to a possible confrontation between Nima and Bob Lee. And in it, Kazar was asking if Bob Lee was OK. Hallie? Nyla Charles, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a spokesperson for Harry Belafonte says the singer, actor, and activist died today of congestive heart failure. Belafonte first made his mark back in the 50s, popularizing Caribbean calypso music here in the U.S., but some say his most lasting legacy was his work as an outspoken champion for black civil rights and his close friendship with Martin Luther King. He was 96 years old. Number two, General Motors GM says it's going to stop making its electric Chevy Bolt models by the end of the year. Timing is sort of interesting here and honestly kind of weird because it's the company's best selling EV. But GM says they're basically old school as far as EVs go and some of the company's newer electric cars have better batteries. Number three, the College Board says it'll revise its AP African American Studies course after critics said the agency gave in to political pressure by taking out certain topics. Remember, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, the Republican governor there, has threatened to ban the course in his state, accusing the College Board of pushing what he called a political agenda. Still TBD on what these changes are and when they'll actually be made public, but we're on top of it. Number four, look at this, Ed Sheeran walking into court to testify today in that copyright infringement trial we told you about 24 hours ago. He's being accused of copying Marvin Gaye 
to build his song, Thinking Out Loud. Sheeran's legal team is denying all the allegations. Number five, the first ever Barbie doll with Down syndrome is coming out soon from Mattel. The company says the doll was created to let even more kids see themselves in Barbie and that they work closely with the National Down Syndrome Society. It'll be released as part of Mattel's Fashionistas line, which the company describes as an inclusive range of dolls. Tonight, for the first time since Tucker Carlson's firing from Fox, we're hearing from a former Fox producer who used to work on a show, raising some new questions about why he was fired. Abby Grossberg, who herself was fired from Fox after filing lawsuits against the company for what she called a hostile work environment. You see her there with MSNBC's Nicole Wallace in just the last hour or so, talking about what went through her mind when she heard that bombshell news that Carlson was out at Fox. Listen. Tucker and his executive producer, Justin Wells, who was also fired, really were responsible for breaking me and making my life a living hell. So there is a feeling of justice, but it's only partial. Grossberg says Carlson and his team created a racist and sexist workplace and alleges in her lawsuit that Fox's lawyers coerced her into giving misleading testimony in that huge Dominion suit. Fox has denied those allegations. Carlson's firing came, of course, after that legal battle between Dominion and Fox News revealed some damaging behind-the-scenes details about the way that Carlson saw his guests, his staff, politicians, and the network itself. But Carlson kind of already has sort of another job offer. Some of Russia's state-run media networks say Carlson would be welcome to come work for them. Carlson often took Russia's side when talking about the war in Ukraine. NBC's Cynthia McFadden is covering this for us. And Cynthia, we're glad to have you on because you know this stuff so well. You spoke with Abby Grossberg previously. You've spoken with her in just the last couple of hours. What's your reporting here? What do we know? Well, Abby Grossberg, as you as her, you heard her say to call, um, feels in some ways that she's been vindicated by the firing of, of Tucker Carlson. She says she said to me, and I'm quoting her: "She believes it's a good thing for the American people um, that they made their own bed, and while she'd like to be sympathetic, uh, she believes that they deserve to be fired." But she said it's not enough. Executives knew exactly what was going on and did nothing. So she says she will not settle this lawsuit until she has been given a public apology. What is next for her? And, and, and how does her firing affect the future of her lawsuits? Uh, it does it. Um, I'm not her firing. Carlson's firing, in other words. Like, yeah. does that make a difference in her legal thing? No, she's fired. She's, uh, fired. She has uh, sued both of them, and so they are both uh, on the hook. They'll have their own representation. Uh, you know, a, a couple of interesting things did happen today, though. You know, she... Uh, the Los Angeles Times, and we can put this up, I think you can see it, um, this is their reporting, not ours, and we have not confirmed it, but they say that Carlson's exit is related mm. to the discrimination lawsuit that Abby Grossberg, uh, a producer fired by the network last month, that it is related to this lawsuit specifically. Uh, you know, it's interesting, Hallie, because when you dig into the documents, and you know I'm such a nerd, all right, here, here, here's some of them. This is yeah. about a tenth of the lawsuit materials, but when you dig into it, you see that Fox paid the largest ever settlement with the Human Rights Commission in New York City for their past actions. They paid a million dollar fine to the Human Rights Commission to settle claims of widespread sexual misconduct. And now listen, if there's any other misconduct in the period of two years, which this falls within, they can be subject to other penalties and assessed accordingly. Now, look, Fox can afford to pay a lot of million dollars, but do they really want the city government of New York in their newsroom? I suspect they do not. So mm -hmm. maybe we don't understand all of the machinations that are going on behind the scenes, but I think that's an interesting uh, piece of the puzzle. Well, it is certainly capturing so many people's attention, given who Tucker Carlson was, how high profile he was, with questions about where he ends up next. Cynthia McFadden, glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. As always. When we come back, demonstrators arrested after supporting a Montana state lawmaker who they say was silenced by Republican leaders. Some of those tense moments and why they say her mic was being cut off next. In a new twist, we're learning there will be no floor session in the Montana State House today after a wild scene that's been playing out there. Protesters storming the building this week, accusing Republicans of silencing the first openly transgender lawmaker in the state for a third day. Listen. Order! 
I mean, you heard it there, and you're looking at some of the video here. Dozens of people outside the building. They then make their way in. Cops go in. They Police follow them in. They're confronting them. You see some of that there. They're shouting from the balcony down to the floor. Seven protesters were arrested. You had Republicans in Montana, some of them responding, calling this an insurrection, a riot by far-left agitators. They were there in support of Democrat Zoe Zephyr, who says she was silenced. You see her there. There she is, lifting a mic that was turned off, by the way, above her head during some of these moments here. All of it started earlier this month when Zephyr spoke out against a proposed bill that would restrict when kids can change names and pronouns they use in school. And the only thing I will say is if, I, if you vote yes on this bill and yes on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. Kristen Dahlgren is with us now, and this is a sort of local political story that has exploded, I think, onto the national stage here because of some of the images that we've seen, what has played out at this point. Um, what do we know about what is actually happening here in Montana? We know Zephyr was not formally censured, right? Um, but Republicans unhappy, obviously demonstrators are unhappy that they say she's being silenced. Where does this go? Right. I mean, and, and quite heated on uh, both sides. So it's worth looking at what Republican lawmakers, how they explained their actions, turning off her mic, uh, not letting her speak. They say their, the, the, their actions, meaning the protesters, did not represent Montana values, that House leadership will stand firm in commitment to decorum, safety, order, and we will uphold the people's will that sent 68 Republicans to Helena. Uh, for her part, Zephyr was tweeting, and she said that she stands with the protesters and is devoted to those who rise in defense of democracy. Uh, but you mentioned that this is a local issue, and certainly, you know, how heated it got was. But this is also some discussion that's happening around the country. Eleven states this year have passed bans uh, on this type of gender-affirming either surgery or treatment for young people. So it's happening in a lot of of places where this debate is happening. It is rare, though, at this point that these debates are happening with actually a transgender lawmaker uh, having those debates. And so it did get quite, quite heated there in Montana, Hallie. What about the underlying plan that sort of sparked all of this, right? This bill proposed by the Montana governor, Greg John Forte. Um, there's a lot of amendments being debated, et cetera. Et cetera. What is the ultimate outcome going to be here from a legislative perspective? Right. So let's start with what this bill is intended to do. I think we have a full screen for that. It aims to ban public funds for surgery or treatment for trans youth. Uh, there's a ban on the use of puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. It restricts when the age at which kids can either change their names or their pronouns. And it also would require parental consent for any change in a name or a pronoun. Uh, there is the majority support in both houses for it, so it is likely to move forward. As for the Republican governor, uh, it's expected that he would be in support of this as well. He doesn't even like the term gender-affirming, Hallie. He has called that Orwellian news speak. Um, and, you know, at this point, as we're talking about it, it's worth pointing out that 1.3 million adults and 300,000 children across this country uh, identify as transgender. So a much, much bigger issue than what's happening in Montana as well. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, a new bill in Florida would let fire stations and hospitals put in boxes, essentially where people can put unwanted babies. We're looking at the lesser known debate over something being called baby boxes next. Plus, remember that big SpaceX rocket that exploded last week? Turns out it's debris spread out way farther than expected. We'll tell you what experts are so worried about after a break. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it takes us down to Florida with a new debate over a bill that would let fire stations and hospitals install safe haven boxes like the kind you see here for people to put unwanted babies in without interacting with anybody. Some say these boxes could save lives. Others say the human contact is important to the baby's short and long-term health. Guad Venegas has the story. You sure you want to do this? Yeah, yeah. Just hurry, please. These ventilated and climate-controlled infant safety devices 
allow mothers to surrender a baby without human interaction. Monica Kelsey founded the organization that makes the boxes already found in 10 different states. When a mother walks up to the baby box and opens the door, an immediate 911 call goes out. When she places the newborn inside, a second alarm is tripped. When she shuts the door, the door actually locks. So the baby can only be retrieved from the inside of the firehouse. Under the current safe haven law, mothers can surrender infants at fire stations and hospitals by handing the infant to a trained professional who can provide resources. It allows a mother to surrender her baby seven days old or less to a hospital or fire station with a direct transfer without fear of prosecution and with guaranteed anonymity. Finding a safe place for mothers who need to give up their child is growing more urgent. With North Dakota and Florida the latest states to pass restrictive abortion laws after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. Joel Gordon from Safe Haven for Newborns says over the years the organization has helped more than 6,000 mothers, yet they oppose the baby boxes. The baby box idea creates a level of distress for that new mother. There's no contact. The baby could be sick, the baby could be abused, the baby could be trafficked. But Monica argues existing devices around the country have already saved 28 newborns. I'm not telling every woman to utilize our baby box. That, that's the last thing I want. But what I want is these babies that are being left in dumpsters and trash cans to have a safe place to fall. Ultimately, the proposed change would allow mothers to decide. It's a very difficult situation for them to, to face that. So if they want to, to keep them anonymous, I think it's a good thing or a good way to do it. The transfer from the mother to the fire department, I think should be a little bit different. More in person, maybe have give it to a person. To, it's a baby, you know, it's not like an object, I, I feel. With the, the law changing in Florida when it comes to uh, abortion, uh, what do you expect will happen in the state of Florida? You know, we've never had a time in our history where abortion was uh, not readily available and the safe haven law was. So I, I don't really think any of us know what's going to happen. Guad Venegas is joining us now live from Miami. Have any of these boxes been installed anywhere in Florida, Guad, or what's the status of this? Hallie, Monica told us there is one box in Florida in Ocala. She says that was installed after the mayor himself petitioned the box. She also told us that a baby has been delivered at the box. So she's very glad that it's been installed. And she's also in conversations with four different locations who plan to install a box. In fact, one of those locations, she says she's already decided to move forward. Uh, she also made it clear that this law that is going through the Florida legislature would help fire stations and hospitals would essentially facilitate uh, for them to have these boxes. But the current law does not keep her from installing the boxes. So she does plan to move forward with helping any locations that want one of these baby boxes, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, at least one person has been killed after a fire at a petroleum plant in Illinois today. You can see some of it here in the aftermath. The explosion was so big that some power lines nearby came down. Officials say the blast itself happened inside an asphalt tank and that there's now no danger to the public. Out of our Southeast Bureau, hundreds of drag queens holding a rally at the Florida State Capitol today, protesting plans that they say attack the LGBTQ plus community. The so-called Protection of Children bill would ban certain drag performances. It passed the Republican-led State House and State Senate and just need the Republican governor's signature at this point. Out of our Western Bureau, look at this, a curious moose in Alaska making its way to a local movie theater. Redefining. Get your popcorn ready, folks. It's all caught on camera. This moose is exploring the lobby. It actually did eat some popcorn um, and then heads out the back door. Like, what a, what a night out. What an adventure for the moose and that poor concession worker. So listen, some new concerns tonight with debris continuing to come down, or at least was coming down over parts of Texas after that SpaceX rocket blew up during its flight. There was no crew on board, of course, but experts say the launch kicked up a huge cloud of debris that ended up spreading way more than expected, with people up to six miles away reporting stuff raining down on their heads. Starship was the biggest rocket ever built, and SpaceX said even though it exploded, the mission was still successful, but the feds are now doing a mishap investigation, meaning no launches for the near future. CNBC space reporter Michael Sheets is joining us now. You were down there for this launch, and this sort of 
I, I think it's fair to say spin afterwards was like, hey, this was actually successful. It got off the launch pad. Like, that's a good thing. Now there's all this other, like, aftermath that's coming out that doesn't seem to bode so well for SpaceX. And the FAA is stepping in, right? That's right, Hallie. And I want to just preface all of this by saying, look, when you launch the world's ro largest and most powerful rocket, there's quite a few side effects that happen. Like you said, I was down there in Texas, about five miles away. And the sound alone, I mean, just it shakes your chest. It sh vibrates the earth around you. And sure enough, yeah, it, it kicked up a huge cloud of dust. It blew concrete into the Gulf of Mexico about a half mile away. So we're seeing the, the kind of after effects now and the picking up of the pieces of how bad is the damage to the local area? You know, how much infrastructure damage did the, the rocket cause to the launch pad and whether or not they can actually try to get this thing off the ground in the next prototype for another mission and another attempt? And can they actually safeguard environmentally and, and locally and, and just even the basic infrastructure from this damage happening again? Especially when you think about the whole plan around Starship is to try to be able to launch this thing on on a weekly, if not daily basis, you're not going to be doing that if you're kicking up this much debris. With that debris kind of coming down from that sort of um, diameter several miles outside the, the, the explosion site, how has it affected people in Texas? Well, Hallie, I spoke to some people there on the ground, and I didn't see an immediate effect right away. But again, this is the kind of, you know, fallout. We, we saw the dust cloud and the, the images that folks were sharing, the concrete scattered around. This is going to be something the FAA, who's really the one, the regulator overseeing this project, they're going to be taking a close look at before that SpaceX actually tries to get another Starship prototype off the ground. Michael Sheets, thank you very much. Thanks for coming on and talking us through it. Appreciate it. Still to come, for everybody sneezing and sniffling and itching your eyes now, stick with us because we're going to explain the allergy situation as it's happening and why they are so bad this year, even if you've never had them before. That's next. New research from NBC's medical team today shows if you think you're having allergies for the first time, you're probably right. More and more people in their 30s and 40s and 50s are getting seasonal allergies for the first time ever. With symptoms, a lot of us longtime sufferers know well. The sneezing, the sniffling, the itchy, dry eyes. This new research also shows that allergies this year are starting even earlier than they normally would. Why? Why is this happening? Experts say blame climate change. There's a warmer winter this year, so things are blooming sooner, meaning pollen season is longer than it usually is. Let's bring in Dr. Natalie Azar. And Dr. Natalie, you know this is not news to me, as my team calls them allergies because they are so bad for me. What's interesting is somebody in my household is now getting them for the first time ever, they think. But how is he supposed to know if it's allergies and not just getting sick, right? Like, how is anybody supposed to be able to tell the difference of that? I know. I actually was wondering if you knew that I was trying to tell the difference if I was having an allergy <laughs> or a cold in the last two days. And I do this little drill to myself, and you're going to do this to your family okay. member, too. Like, if you basically think of a Venn diagram and you have cold symptoms and allergy symptoms, there's going to be some overlap, like a cough, a runny nose, maybe a little bit of a sore throat. But the number one symptom, Hallie, that will go with allergy that you'll really never see with a cold is those itchy eyes, even an mm. itchy nose or an itchy throat. And I think another thing to really keep in mind, if you're suffering now and it's been two weeks, three weeks, that's allergy. A cold is going to last seven to 10 days. And there's also some seasonality. Now, I know people are developing new, um, new allergies for the first time, but like Cold and flu season is in the winter. P p p people tend right. to not get um, allergy symptoms so much in the summertime. Talk about the climate connection here, because I think it's interesting, like, why it's so bad. We, we talked about how warmer winter means longer pollen season because stuff is blooming earlier. Yeah. I mean, is that the connection here? Is that why so many people are now having first-time allergies in their adult lives, even after never having had them before? Well, I mean, that's the main reason, Hallie. You know, the ground is thawing earlier, trees are going to flower earlier, and they're going to start to produce their pollen earlier. And we have seen absolutely a longer season and significantly more pollen than in years past. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is that a lot of people relocated during the pandemic. And if you're moving to a new area, you might be exposed to a new oh. pollen for the first time and never knew that you had an allergy to it before. So then give us some news you can use. Um, yeah. uh, what are people supposed to do? I would tell you, I, I'm not recommending this, and I know it's probably not good. I take quadruple 
the dose of allergy medication because they're just so bad. And it, and like, I, just anecdotally, one, our producer on, a, on our team here, Lauren, she says she takes an allergy pill every day. It like, doesn't do anything. Yeah. What are you supposed to do? I know, I know. And I think like, so that's the last thing on my on my list is for, for people to think about getting allergy shots. But if you're kind of really taking an antihistamine every single solitary day and quadrupling up on the dose, it's probably time to see an allergist and get some allergy okay. shots. Thanks, but, definitely. <laughs> you sound like my partner. I don't need to hear it from I everybody know, right? in my life. But. but the one thing that's really important is to reduce exposure. And that is, that means like spending time indoors. Maybe you're not, you know, I love opening the window in the springtime, yes. but that's letting all the pollen in. You gotta wash yourself when you come inside. And then obviously the neti pot and the antihistamines, mm -hmm. um, the nasal rinses, nasal sprays, all of that stuff uh, can be super, super helpful. Dr. Natalie Azar. Benefit of having your own show is like personal medical advice from a, yeah, there from you a TV go. expert doctor. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And thanks, uh, I know, on behalf of all allergy sufferers everywhere. That does it for us this hour. We have a lot more coverage for you. It picks up right now. Coming on the air with the country's biggest river about to overflow with insane rain getting the Mississippi to levels it hasn't seen in more than 50 years. Water is spilling out into towns from the Midwest to the Gulf. We'll take it live to Iowa where the flooding could be the worst it's been since the Beatles had the biggest song in the country. Plus, the message from President Biden tonight is clear. He wants to finish the job and he wants four more years to do it out officially announcing his re-election push. Why this new video is featuring the vice president big time. And apparently fighters in Sudan got their hands on a lab that has a, a ton of a dangerous, contagious diseases in it. The kind of things people just don't get anymore. We'll talk about the risks as we speak of a global biological breakout and what our Pentagon team is telling us. Plus, should it be illegal for your kids to be on social media? A couple of senators seem to think so, with a new bill to kick off anybody who's under the age of 13, how it's setting up a battle over parental rights. And more on the fallout from Tucker Carlson's departure from Fox News, what we're hearing today, late today, from his former producer who's suing him and the company. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we're coming on the air tonight, dozens of towns are bracing for what could be some of the worst flooding they've ever seen. And it's not just because of the rain. You've got to focus on the Mississippi River, expected to inch up toward record high levels. There it is under a highway bridge in Minnesota. It's not usually that close to the road. The river's spilled over in some spots. Look at the riverfront in downtown Davenport in Iowa, just covered in water. That looks like an outdoor theater there. The Mississippi, of course, stretches from Louisiana all the way up to Minnesota. And it's the part up north that's the biggest concern now, with the flood watch down through Wisconsin and Iowa, Illinois to Missouri here. In some spots, you can see the river rise to the highest it's been since The Sound of Music premiered, 1965. Just look at this yacht club outside St. Paul, Minnesota. I mean, it's almost totally underwater at this point. And the flood risk runs all the way out west to California, too, for a different reason. As it's getting warmer, that record-setting snowpack in the Sierra we told you about all winter, it'll start melting. Yosemite National Park already has a flood watch set to begin just about 48 hours from now. Our Maggie Vespa is in one of the spots expecting to see some of the worst flooding in this round, Davenport, we showed you earlier. So Maggie, the governor there in Iowa has already put out like a disaster proclamation. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Right. Hallie, uh, what we're hearing, and this actually kicked in when you said the sound of music, so I had to laugh at that. This is a sand truck behind us. You can see they're dumping that much more sand to keep filling sandbags. Davenport floods, okay? This is a city that floods pretty regularly, at least once a year, but this is a serious one. People say they're not really playing around with this one at all. Again, some areas along the Mississippi River are expected to have their worst flood in 20 years. We just talked to a woman who's about 20 miles from here. She already has to boat to and from her house. Take a listen to what she told us. I would like to say that you get used to it. You buy in the river, you know what happens when you buy in the river, but it's never the same thing. There's always something that's slightly different about it. And this water came up really fast this time. Yeah, this water coming up really fast is exactly what she told us. That's a key difference. Also a big difference, Hallie. We've been talking about this. Our climate unit pointing out this is not this flood, which will likely go on for days, not the result of like a fast moving system that's dumping rain. This is a result of that snowpack like you just talked about in the Sierras out west. That's also the situation in Minnesota and North Dakota. Up to 18 inches of snow after this 
massive winter storm after massive winter storm uh, this season dumped that snow out there. That's what's melting. That is what is feeding the Mississippi River up north. All that water coming south and slowly flooding a lot of these river adjacent communities, Hallie. I mean, as you are uh, uh, gamely yelling over the, the noise of that sand truck, Maggie, I know that that's one of the things that people are doing as the river levels are expected to go up more and more throughout the week. Um, people are really bracing yes. for this. It's not raining, and that's the, that's the point, right? It's not the rain. You're not going to expect to see these big storms. It's the water levels rising. Exactly. You really, it almost in a weird way makes it kind of harder to predict, right? Like, you don't know when the rain is going to be coming or when it's going to stop. This is just that slow-moving trickle Lovely. This is that slow moving trickle that's coming down again from the snowpack. So we want to show you that in mind. Officials want people to keep this kind of four step plan um, in mind, ready to kind of jump into action at any point. They want people to have an emergency plan, be ready to evacuate at any point, pack an emergency kit and be ready to go on for several days, whether that's clothes, medication, food, you name it. Stay informed about the forecast and follow local alerts. Listen to what your officials are saying, because it's very possible that a lot of this water could move into a lot of these communities overnight. You could go to bed, think you're fine, wake up, realize you're not. And this is important, Hallie. Again, this could last for several days. Parts of Minnesota expected to crest later this week. Parts of Illinois and Iowa, where yeah. we are, it might not happen until early next week. So long haul situation with these floods. That is Hallie. for sure for them and for everybody with that truck course pulling up behind you. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much. In the next hour or so, President Biden is set to meet with the South Korean president not too long after telling Americans he wants another four years in the White House, officially relaunching his reelection after months of speculation. And he's kind of hitting the ground running, hopping on a Zoom call not too long ago with a bunch of Democratic governors, you see them here, to make sure they're on board with his message. That message being given today to a friendly union crowd. Our economic plan is working. We now have to finish the job, but there's more to do. Finish the job. That was a big theme in this video that came out today in which the formal announcement of the re-election push happened. Talked about themes of personal freedom, asking people if they want more or fewer rights, going after so-called MAGA extremists, and the kind of founding father of the MAGA movement, Donald Trump. That was a big part of this here, and it seems to preview a strategy that the Biden campaign will take over the next 18 months if, in fact, Donald Trump is the Republican nominee on that side of the aisle. Our Shaq Brewster caught up with voters in a deep blue part of Wisconsin to get a kind of vibe check on the announcement from the president today. Check it out. I don't think the other side is trying to unite the nation. I think they're trying to tear it apart. If those are going to be my two choices, 100% um, Biden, I can't do another four years of Trump. I really wanted uh, a progressive, younger Democrat to go for it. Monica Alba is at the White House. And already, Mon, what we're seeing with your new reporting is a president who wants to make sure everybody's on the same page here in some of these key battleground states vis-a-vis -vis this call with these governors, as he also is combating what I think we just heard um, from our colleague Shaq there, talking with some voters out, out in the Midwest. That woman saying she wanted somebody younger. The president's age. He would be 82 uh, if he were to be inaugurated and win. That is a factor that the campaign is thinking about as well. 82 if he wins, 86 at the end of a second term if he were to serve in that entirety, Hallie, in that scenario. And that's notable today because the White House press secretary was asked if he would. She sort of sidestepped it and said, I don't want to get ahead of the president. That's something for him to decide. And then immediately walked that back after the briefing saying, yes, he would intend to serve that if he were to win this next term. But before we get to that, the president is going to be, of course, constantly coordinating with these key stakeholders. So today, he did speak with these Democratic governors from the campaign point of view. We know he speaks with governors regularly, of course, in his official capacity on all kinds of matters concerning the nation. But today was specifically about battleground messaging and trying to kind of talk about these key states. We do know there's this major push for the Midwest, as you mentioned, and specifically, that's one of the reasons Chicago is going to be hosting the Democratic convention next year. J.B. Pritzker on that call is one of those key allies the president will be talking to a lot in the interim time. Um, a colleague that you and I both know well, Mike Memoli, has been speaking to a lot of people who are close to the president here who say this campaign is going to put his economic vision to the test, right? One of them is longtime advisor Mike Donilon, who says President Biden is leading a fundamental shift in economic policy in this country. But polling here at NBC News show most voters 
aren't really digging what the president's putting down, right, when it comes to the economy. We know that is a major mobilizing issue for people. Inflation is ticking down, but concerns of a recession are still out there, Mon. I mean, that is one of the big unknowns. We don't know where the economy is going to be in the fall when it's really going to matter for voters. Yeah, and the president alluded to this in his union remarks earlier today. He didn't go into, hey, I'm uh, launching my reelect. I want everybody to focus on that. He said, look, what I know people are really talking about is feeling the pinch from inflation, and that's very much a real concern. So he is trying to tackle that head on. But I think what's so notable and that Mike wrote in that piece you just put up there is that this is a White House that is sort of going to run a campaign that Joe Biden didn't get to run in 2016 when he decided at the 11th hour that he wasn't going to go for the Democratic nomination. Instead, the 2020 campaign, his last successful run at this, was in many parts, they say, about COVID and about Donald Trump. And they weren't able to focus on some of this working class messaging that the president always wants to put forward. And so we are now understanding that for this next campaign, it's almost like pulling out the old playbook from things he wanted to run on when he was contemplating that eight years ago, that he's now going to be able to put front and center by trying to argue, hey, here are the things I'm doing for people that is hopefully making their lives a little bit better as the economic recovery continues. But those numbers are still, he says, way too high, trying to ease that. But this White House and this president will argue going in the right direction. Hallie. So listen, Mom, when we looked at that video, it's not just featuring President Biden, although it is. There's a lot of Vice President Kamala Harris. We put together, our team did all the frames from this three-minute video, right, of when she's speaking. You can see, like, the, the Kamala mash here. She's actually talking right now about abortion rights at her alma mater, Howard University. That is an issue where she is expected, I think, right, to take more of a role, as you can see some of those pictures from the video, the rollout today. Talk about the Kamala Harris, the VP factor in this campaign here. Yeah, and this is a really important point, and those visuals absolutely tell the story. We went back and watched then-President Obama's re-elect video from 2011. It did not feature then-Vice President Joe Biden, just to give you an idea here. This is a very yeah. different kind of approach, and it's very clear that they are wanting to really point to where they see the vice president being able to take total leadership on certain topics, to your point when it comes to abortion access, which he's talking about today, and also on voting rights. And that is why you saw the vice president hours after in Nashville and in Tennessee when those state lawmakers were expelled. She's the one who traveled there and went and spoke in some very forceful remarks. And that's something aides have been pointing to. You're going to see a lot more of the vice president sometimes doing and stepping into those big leadership moments. Moments. And so the partnership here between the president and vice president is something that's going to be highlighted, I think, a lot. But we can really expect to see her doing even more travel in the coming months while the president isn't going to do any official campaigning in the more traditional sense for quite some time. Hallie. Monica Alba live for us at the White House. Mon, thank you. For former President Trump today, it is not a political fight, but a legal battle taking center stage in a civil trial over rape allegations. Court in New York just wrapping up for the day not too long ago. You can see some of the sketches from the courtroom here. Writer E. Jean Carroll's lawyer saying in her opening statement that her client blamed herself for the former president allegedly raping her, which is why she didn't come forward sooner. Now, she told the jury her client just wants her life back after being branded, and I'm quoting here, a liar and a fraud by Mr. Trump. The alleged rape at the center of Carol's lawsuit happened in the 90s in a department store dressing room, she says. But Mr. Trump's defense attorney, as Mr. Trump denies the allegations, tells the jury the evidence will prove that Carol's accusations are unbelievable and unexplainable, in his words. You see teams for both here, the both teams arriving to the courthouse in New York. Donald Trump's lawyer on the left, Carol and her team on the right. The trial is one of multiple legal issues the former president and, by the way, of course, current presidential candidate now faces. Ali Vitali joins us now. And Ali, um, in like a different, let's put ourselves in like a, a brand new different universe here, like Earth 6, right? And looking at the allegations here <laughs> and the way that this has gone down and what it could mean for a presidential candidate um, it is in, it's an inversion, I think, of the of the conventional thinking around a politician. Um, and it is it is something that Donald Trump, uh, it, it, as we say, one of multiple legal issues. This isn't even the one that I think his team is the most sort of focused on or looking at as what could be a liability here. Talk us through it. Yeah, it's stunning because this is certainly one of the cases that I hear about the least in my conversations with sources and voters. But Look at that legal screen that you just put up, the center of it being Trump and all of the different spokes around it. 
Being the center of multiple legal probes is a bad thing. Being indicted is a bad thing. Being someone who is credibly accused of rape or sexual misconduct is a bad thing. And yet, we have watched Trump at each turn of each of those things manage to somehow turn this into an instance where he is the victim in some way. And I say that because even though those are often sometimes the words that he uses, it's what voters tell me, too. When I was in Iowa just over the weekend, many of them referenced the baggage in their words that the former president is carrying into this next election cycle, and they almost feel defensive of him. They feel that it's unfair. They feel that these aren't charges in any of the indictment cases or possible indictment cases that he should be facing in the first place. And it's yet again another instance where voters can see in it what they choose to see, which is the deep state or the political deep-seated media and others going after the former president, even though that's not at all what's happening, and their votes could reflect that. They could stand by the former president, and our poll shows recently that that's what they want to do because they want to show that nothing can get him down. Ali Vitali live for us there in Arlington, Virginia. Ali, thank you. We've got to get to some breaking news here that's coming into us at the network in just the last couple of minutes. Three U.S. officials tell NBC News that the Taliban has killed the ISIS mastermind behind the Kabul airport bombing that killed 13 U.S. service members and more than 150 Afghans during the U.S. withdrawal there. The U.S. military was apparently not involved in this operation, according to those officials. NBC's Andrea Mitchell is tracking this, along with our colleague Courtney Kuby, who covers the Pentagon. Tell us more, Andrea. What do we know? Well, what we know is that they are now officially notifying the families, the families of the 13 troops who died in that horrific uh, terror plot right at the, uh, at the gate there at the airport after that horribly confusing and chaotic mm -hmm. evacuation from Afghanistan. They're notifying the families. They say that they were not involved, the U.S. was not involved, that this was the, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan killing a rival group, a rival terror group, the ISIS group. And the fact is that this was supposedly the mastermind. We don't have the, the name of this alleged terrorist who was killed, apparently, according to the Pentagon right now which is citing their information that they're getting from the Taliban, which, Hallie, this only reinforces the fact that the U.S. is not in Afghanistan and that they are, you know, that their counter-terrorist strategy now depends on one bad group killing another bad group or relying on the Taliban. These, you know, acknowledged terrorist leaders of Afghanistan who've taken over the government killing a rival faction, the ISIS faction. Also, earlier this week, as you know, the document, the uh, documents that had been leaked allegedly by Jack Teixeira included a document that the Washington Post published saying that they had a document that had been, the authenticity had been confirmed by the Pentagon indicating yeah. that ISIS was becoming an increasing threat in Afghanistan, including with aspirations to hit the West, including the United States. What does this say, Andrew? You know, back when the U.S. pulled out, withdrew from Afghanistan, there was some discussion that the capabilities that we had in the region would not be diminished because of the possibility, the ability to do, they called them, you know, exactly. over, over the horizon kinds of things. Um, how does this fit into that bigger picture of what the U.S.'s capabilities are in the region here? Well, I think it completely undermines that claim that you so correctly point out of Oh, well, we're not going to lose the intelligence. We're not going to lose the ability to do over the high horizon hits. We didn't do this, they say. Uh, the Taliban did. We didn't know it when it happened. We didn't confirm it until three days later. So what original intelligence do we have from over the horizon, other than what the Taliban is telling us, and how do we trust that? But mm -hmm. they are, they apparently do trust it. They've at least confirmed it well enough to be informing the families who were already angry at some statements made by Lord, Lloyd Austin and others at the Pentagon this week, this past week, telling Congress that they were proud of the withdrawal. Not meaning, of course, this horrible loss, the worst that this administration has experienced with 13 troops dying in Afghanistan yeah. after the chaotic withdrawal, but proud of the fact that the president did achieve his goal of getting the ending a 20-year war and getting all U.S. troops out. Hallie? Andrea Mitchell, um, it is, uh, of course, significant developing news here coming into us. Thank you so much for getting to a camera and for sharing it with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you.
a dramatic warning today about the risk of biohazards getting loose in Sudan after fighters took control of a lab there that contains some very dangerous and very contagious diseases. We're talking stuff like measles, polio, cholera. Lab techs can't even get in to secure this stuff because of all the fighting that's happening in the area. The WHO sounding the alarm tonight won't say which side has captured this lab, the army or the paramilitary rapid support forces. It's happening as the world is holding its breath in the middle of a very fragile 72-hour ceasefire, which has already been punctured by moments of violence. And as the State Department is now confirming just in the last minute or so that a second American has died in Sudan, with the State Department spokesperson telling NBC News that this person, a U.S. citizen, died on April 25th, that they are in touch with their family and offer their deepest condolences on their loss. NBC's Courtney Kuby joins me now. This lab situation is potentially very scary, uh, Court. Give us, like, the, the gut check on how concerned we should be, what's being done about it, what the temperature check is there at the Pentagon. It, there's a lot of concern about it. I mean, th about it, Hallie. There's, this is no joke. So it's things like polio, like measles. There are a couple of a couple of things that people, officials here and in the administration are are, are very worried about this. Number one, one of, you just said in the intro, they aren't saying who is in control of this lab now. We don't know which side is actually there. And we, but we know who whoever the fighters were that went in, they kicked the technicians out. So the concern mm. is that some of these these viruses and some of these contaminants they may not be handled properly by these fighters who were in there. The other concern is just the overall security situation that exists in Khartoum right now in Sudan. It is so volatile that if one, if this location were to be hit or to come under fire, if there was some sort of a, a vulnerability to it, well, now there's no technicians there to theoretically keep these samples safe. So there's a lot of concern about this right now, Hallie. You, you talked about how we don't know which side. Right? Does it matter which side? In other words, if it's the army or if it's the paramilitary force, like, are, is one option better than the other, or is it just bad, period, that these lab techs can't get in to secure this, these uh, contagious viruses? So if it was the Army side, the more official Sudanese side, then then the U.S. has some could have talks with them. So that might be more positive. But the reality is either side being in charge without offic officials who know these, these um, yeah. pathogens is dangerous. Um, quick update on this ceasefire, right? I mean, we've seen it. We've seen some of these moments of violence. We know that there are, like, th talks about evacuations for the Americans left in Sudan happening. What's the status update? That's right. So there is still hope that maybe this one will hold. There's, it's, there has been some violence, but it seems that it might be slowing down a little bit. There's some optimism there. And that's because the hope is that if the violence quiets at all, then it might be an opportunity to get more civilians and more government officials from other countries out of the, the, that country, out of Khartoum specifically. We heard a little bit about that from the State Department today, about why this ceasefire is so important. Here's what they had to say. We think that a ceasefire uh, is uh, really important to not just uh, to be representative of the will of the Sudanese people, but for uh, allowing the access of humanitarian aid uh, and for the appropriate next steps to take place for us to get this from a ceasefire to a specific uh, cessation of hostilities uh, between these two generals. So what we just heard there is sort of the carrot of what the international community right. is saying to Sudan is you want so you want to get some humanitarian aid which is more and more critical every day there then you need to agree to the ceasefire and we'll be able to get things in safely that's the hope here is that that's why what both sides may actually agree to is because they they need help Courtney QB uh, juggling a lot there tonight at the Pentagon court thank you a lot going on on Capitol Hill, too, with an eye-popping plan. Senators from both sides of the aisle about to roll out a bill that would make using social media illegal for kids under the age of 13. It would make it against the law for those kids, tweens, let's call them, to use Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. Kids 13 to 17 would need permission from parents. And the bill would restrict some of the algorithms that social media companies use that target minors. It is one piece of a broader push by state and local and now federal officials to limit how and when kids can get onto these platforms. You see those new laws in Utah and Arkansas that already require parental permission before kids can sign up for these platforms. Now, here's the thing. Keep in mind, right, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, they already say you have to be 13 to get on, to sign up. But kids have certainly found ways to get online before that age. NBC's Jake Ward is covering this for us. 
We talk a lot about the way that Capitol Hill lawmakers want to try to regulate social media, specifically when it comes to kids. This has been a push for years now, but this is a new twist on the plan, right? Like making it illegal for 12 and under to be on something like TikTok or TikTok or Snapchat. Talk us through some of the dynamics That's right. here, Jake. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think, you know, until now, Hallie, we really relied on the tech industry itself to, in theory, police this issue. And that is why we have this 13-year-old uh, standard that has been the standard across the tech industry. I think it's important to point out that science is very much uh, not in support of the idea that 13 is somehow a safe age at which uh, social media uh, can be used. But we seem to see uh, lawmakers sort of, you know, realizing at this point that these companies cannot necessarily police themselves. I mean, you know, when back when we had uh, those big leaks that came out of uh, Meta, out of Facebook, uh, you know, back at that time, it was clear that uh, that company was talking internally about the need to bring on as many kids as possible to replace uh, users that were uh, disappearing from the platform. We know that these companies really, really want young people to get acclimated to using social media. At the same time, lawmakers are starting to hear from experts who have told them that the country is in the grip of a mental health crisis, especially when it comes to kids. I mean, the numbers are extraordinary and the connection between the use of social media, the use of screens, and the use of this stuff has been very strong for a long time, Hallie. How, but, like, you talk about the enforcement issue, right? Like, and you said, and we know that Facebook and some of these platforms say you have to be 13 and over. How are lawmakers going to know if parents are letting their kids under the age of 13 get on these platforms, or is this more about incentivizing parents to be able to say no and pointing to, let's say, a law, if it passes on Capitol Hill, that would stop that? Well, I think it could very much have both effects. I think it's really important to note that lawmakers are increasingly realizing that it's not up to them to figure out the technical specifics of how a company is going to comply with things, right? The Montana ah. TikTok ban that's under consideration right. right now does not put it on lawmakers to figure out how that would work, puts it on TikTok to figure out how that would work. In this case, it's very much on the platforms to figure that stuff out. That seems to be the emphasis here, Hallie. How much, you know, I wonder how much of an issue this is, because I will tell you, my kid, just anecdotally, my kid is three. I'm not worried about her getting on social media just yet. That'll be something I'll worry about in the years to come. But I'm thinking in my head, and maybe people think this who are like around my, my age, like, do 10 year olds care? Like, do they want to get online? Do they want to get on TikTok and Snapchat? Anecdotally, I have heard from parents who say, uh, hell yes, my 10 year old wants to get on this at 11, 12. Like, that is the age where they want to start doing this. How much of an issue is this, right? And like, what are we seeing? Do we have some numbers to back this up? Well, we absolutely know that the science shows that there is an absolute correlation here between using this stuff and distraction from schoolwork, disruption of sleep cycles, the rise of mental health issues. That stuff is pretty well established. Is it causative? We don't know yet. But the correlation, the fact that these things are happening together, that's really strong at this point, Hallie. Jake Ward, uh, really interesting stuff. We're going to see how this goes when it gets rolled out officially uh, in the days to come. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, a new warning around the gummies you might eat to help you sleep. No, not cannabis. We'll tell you why experts say they could maybe contain dangerous levels of melatonin. Plus, Netflix making a big bet on the success of some international shows. We're going to tell you about it coming up in The Five Things. A major move from General Motors, why the company is ditching its most popular electric car. That's coming up in the five things. But first, the family of the murdered Cash App founder in court in San Francisco today, facing his alleged killer with arraignment now delayed for a second time. The lawyer for suspect Nima Momeni asking to postpone for a week because she says she didn't get proper discovery documents for the case. But she did preview what her client will say when the arraignment does happen. Listen. A plea isn't an argument. A plea is a plea. And the plea is going to be not guilty. Momeni is accused of killing Bob Lee with more than 20 members of Lee's family in court today, including his children. Some of Momeni's relatives were also in court, but not his sister, who prosecutors say was at the center of an argument between Lee and Momeni on the night of Lee's murder. Nayala Charles is joining us now. Nayala, this was significant when it happened. This is somebody who's well-known in the tech world, in Silicon Valley, in the sort of business world. Um, there were a lot of questions about his death and what happened here, and these charges proved to be kind of a stunning revelation for people in Northern California and beyond. Talk to us about this moment in court here, Bob Lee's family coming face-to-face -face with his alleged killer, and the details about this relationship between um, the various individuals involved. 
Right, so more than 20 of Bob Lee's family and friends there, including his two kids. Now, the arraignment, though, Hallie, was pushed today for the second time because Momeni's defense attorney says she didn't receive all of the discovery here. She says she didn't receive police reports and the autopsy report, though the district attorney has pushed against the back against that claim, saying that they have provided more than 20 police reports, DNA reports, and also a lot of video surveillance footage. But prosecutors say not only should the arraignment have happened today because of that, but also because of so many of Bob Lee's family members being present in court. Take a listen. Mr. Lee's children were in court today. Um, and imagine having to repeatedly come back to court, all to have nothing happen. Um, I think it's a real testament to the fact that victims um, in our state truly don't have rights um, to make sure that these cases proceed through trial. They're at the mercy of the defense. The judge, of course, did side with the defense there, but the prosecutor says that next week, Bob Lee's family will be in court. Now, you mentioned the relationship here between all of the people involved, Hallie. The district attorney tells us one of the major focuses on this case will be the nature of the relationship between Bob Lee and the defendant's younger sister, Kuzar Momeni, who is married to a prominent plastic surgeon in the area. Now, court documents say the night of Bob Lee's murder on April fourth, Nemo Meni confronted Bob Lee about a prior interaction he had had with that younger sister at a prior gathering. After that, court documents say they have video surveillance footage of Momeni driving uh, Bob Lee to a secluded area in downtown San Francisco and stabbing him three times with a kitchen knife. Hallie? Now, Alla Charles, uh, live for us with that reporting in California. Now, Alla, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, new details about that deadly Sweet 16 party shooting in Alabama last week that left four people dead. A witness testified today that at least 89 rounds were fired. And police say one of the victims appeared to have a gun placed on his chest after he died. A judge did not immediately rule on bail for the five suspects in court today. Number two, a spokesperson for Harry Belafonte says the singer, the actor, the activist died today of congestive heart failure. Belafonte first made his mark back in the 1950s, popularizing Caribbean calypso music here in the U.S. But some say his most lasting legacy was his work as an outspoken champion for black civil rights. He had a close friendship and partnership with Martin Luther King. Belafonte was 96 years old. Number three, GM says it'll stop making its electric Chevy Bolt models by the end of this year. It's the company's best-selling EV, but GM says the cars are kind of old school as far as EVs go and that some of the company's newer electric cars have way better batteries. Number four, a new study finds potentially dangerous levels of melatonin in some sleep gummies. Harvard researchers found several brands of these like sleep aid gummies have three times more melatonin than what says what it says on the label. One of the things they found, one brand didn't have any melatonin at all. It, it was full of CBD instead. Number five, looks like Netflix is betting big on South Korea. The company says it's committed to spending two and a half billion dollars on South Korean film and TV production over the next four years. Netflix says that's twice as much that it's spent in the country since 2016. It comes after the success of shows like Squid Game and The Glory, plus obviously the huge popularity of K-pop recently. Tonight, for the first time since Tucker Carlson's firing from Fox, we are hearing from a former Fox News producer who used to work on a show, raising new questions about what this departure was all about. Abby Grossberg, who herself was fired from Fox after filing lawsuits against the company for what she calls a hostile work environment, talking with MSNBC's Nicole Wallace late today. Listen. I think it has something to do with it. <laughs> I, I would, I would, I don't know for sure though. It's not a fact. Um, I'd like to think that, if anything, it shows that when you have the truth on your side and you stand up for yourself, people will listen. And for now, that's what I'm taking from it. Commenting there on whether her lawsuit, she thinks, had anything to do with Carlson's departure. Grossberg also says Carlson and his team created a racist and sexist work environment. And she alleges in her lawsuit that Fox's lawyers coerced her into giving misleading testimony in the Dominion suit. Fox has denied these allegations. Now, keep in mind that Carlson's firing Carlson, remember, the highest-rated anchor on the, one of the biggest cable networks in the country. His firing came after the legal fight between Dominion and Fox revealed some damaging behind-the-scenes details about how Carlson viewed his guests, his staff, leaders of the country, the network. Carlson kind of 
already sort of has another job offer. Several of Russia's state-run media networks say Carlson would be welcome to come work for them. He, of course, often took Russia's side when talking about the war in Ukraine. NBC's Cynthia McFadden is covering this one for us. Um, Cynthia, you are well read in and familiar. You've spoken with Abby Grossberg. You know the story well. What do we know about, you know, the reason, these, these sort of mysterious and why Tucker Carlson was fired in the first place? What else are we learning today about this? Well, first, I think we ought to go to another part of that interview that uh, uh, Abby yeah. gave this afternoon to Nicole Wallace, in which she says uh, her reaction to the firing. Take a look. Tucker and his executive producer, Justin Wells, who was also fired, really were responsible for breaking me and making my life a living hell. So there is a feeling of justice, but it's only partial. Now, the reason she says it's partial is because she says, listen, it wasn't just Tucker Carlson and his executive producer who were making her life unbearable. She says executives were well aware and did nothing. She says that she won't settle until they get she gets a public apology. Um, now, I think it's also important to take a look at something the L.A. Times said today. The L.A. Times says that this lawsuit being filed is, in fact, the reason for mm. Tucker Carlson's being fired. Carlson's exit is related to the discrimination lawsuit filed by Abby Grossberg, a producer fired by the network last month, the sources said. Now, NBC News has not been able to independently um, verify this, but it makes sense that it was at least part of the decision, right? I mean, the, the Fox is trying to get rid of this reputation that it's now right. had for a long time that it is a misogynist uh, snake pit. Uh, they had to pay a million dollars to uh, the human rights group here in New York for their hundreds of millions of dollars that they've spent over the last several decades uh, to settle such cases. So you can imagine that the people who... Uh, in the Murdoch family, we're not pleased to find out about this lawsuit. Uh, yeah, here you see some of the some of the story there. A million dollars and any other violation that happens within a two-year period, which this lawsuit falls within, they can charge them more. I don't think it's about the money. I think it's about, surely you don't want to have the city of New York in your newsroom. Uh, yeah. Certainly not under those circumstances. Well, so let me ask you this, right? Abby Grossberg, now Tucker Carlson no longer works for Fox News. Does that have any impact on the on the lawsuits she's brought against them? No. She's suing both okay. of them uh, independently, so you, you, you can't clear one by getting rid of it. Fox doesn't improve its situation by firing Tucker Carlson, and Tucker Carlson's not off the hook. So uh, she will go forward. And as I said, she says she's not going to settle with them unless they will give her a public yeah. apology. We know that the, they were unwilling to do that for the Dominion case, though there was a lot of money paid over. 787 plus million dollars. Cynthia McFadden, thank you so much for that reporting tonight. Really appreciate it. Coming up, another royal secret revealed what Prince Harry's legal team is saying about Prince William and a phone hacking case. That's later in the global. Stay with us. In a new twist, we're learning there will be no floor session in the Montana State House tonight after a wild scene that played out there. Protesters storming the building Monday, accusing Republicans of silencing the first openly transgender lawmaker in the state for a third day. You hear some of it. Listen. I mean, you see the video here, right? Dozens of people outside the building. They're gathering there. Then they make their way in. Police are there. They're, look, you can see they're, looks like they're cuffing one person at least, confronting them as those people are shouting down at the floor from the balcony. Seven protesters in all have been arrested. Republicans responding. They say this is a riot by far-left agitators. These demonstrators were there in support of Democrat Zoe Zephyr, who says she was silenced. You see her there. That's her in the black jacket, the black cardigan, lifting up a mic that had been turned off during all of this going down. The whole thing started earlier this month when Zephyr came out against a proposed bill that would restrict when kids can change their names or pronouns they use in school. Listen. And then the only thing I will say is if I if you vote yes on this bill and yes on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. Kristen Dahlgren is with us now. Explain where this goes from here, right? Because this is something, um, uh, you know, a rather extraordinary scene that we're seeing play out is this sort of local issue. It's the national stage. 
Right. And a tremendous amount of vitriol, uh, as witnessed by, you know, anyone who saw a letter that was sent to Zephyr from the Montana Freedom Caucus, in which she was repeatedly misgendered. Uh, time after time, they used male pronouns. And so, you know, this is an issue that is being talked about in a lot of districts right now as lawmakers sort of grapple uh, with what to do. Eleven states so far this year have passed bans on this type of gender affirming care for young people. But in not many of those places would they be doing it with a transgender lawmaker that they're having these debate with uh, these debates with Republicans continue to say that uh, gender affirming care is dangerous and that children and young people aren't able to make those decisions not mature enough to make those decisions despite the fact that some major medical organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics have said it is more dangerous to enforce these bans and not allow uh, those people to affirm the gender uh, that they would like. And so, you know, it's, it's a very heated situation in many places. And in Montana, it just went way over the top this week into uh, the sort of aggressive um, arrests and protests. Hallie. What about the underlying actual bill that sort of was um, the catalyst for so much of this? Montana Governor Greg Gianforte is proposing it. Um, there's amendments being considered. What's the fate of that? Right. So let's take a look at what that legislation is. Basically, uh, the aim is to limit or um, ban public funds for any type of puberty blocker, surgery or treatment for transgender youth, cross-sex hormones, uh, restrict when kids can change their names and pronouns, and also require parental consent for any change of name or pronouns. Uh, it does have majority support in both houses of the legislature there. And as far as the governor goes, he doesn't even like the term gender affirmation. He's called that Orwellian news speak. And so uh, mm. at the end of the day, he is likely uh, to hold up anything passed by the House. But uh, we'll have to continue to see. And look, they've got a debate, Hallie. They, you know, um, shut down for the day today because of this. But at some point, it has to move forward where there is some type of debate and where everybody is allowed to speak. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, a new fight in Florida over some safety devices that would let parents give up unwanted babies without handing the child to a person. We're taking a look at the debate over so-called baby boxes. Plus, what happened when a Japanese company tried to make history with the first commercial moon landing? That's in the global. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. In Florida tonight, there's a new debate over a bill that would let fire stations and hospitals install so-called safe haven boxes for people to put unwanted babies in without interacting with anyone. Some say these boxes could save lives. Others say handing the child over to a person would be vital to the baby's short and long-term health. Guadavanegas has the story. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, yeah. Just hurry, please. These ventilated and climate-controlled infant safety devices allow mothers to surrender a baby without human interaction. Monica Kelsey founded the organization that makes the boxes already found in 10 different states. When a mother walks up to the baby box and opens the door, an immediate 911 call goes out. When she places the newborn inside, a second alarm is tripped. When she shuts the door, the door actually locks. So the baby can only be retrieved from the inside of the firehouse. Under the current safe haven law, mothers can surrender infants at fire stations and hospitals by handing the infant to a trained professional who can provide resources. It allows a mother to surrender her baby, seven days old or less, to a hospital or fire station with a direct transfer without fear of prosecution and with guaranteed anonymity. Finding a safe place for mothers who need to give up their child is growing more urgent. With North Dakota and Florida, the latest states to pass restrictive abortion laws after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. Joel Gordon from Safe Haven for Newborns says over the years, the organization has helped more than 6,000 mothers, yet they oppose the baby boxes. The baby box idea creates a level of distress for that new mother. There's no contact. The baby could be sick. The baby could be abused. The baby could be trafficked. 
But Monica argues existing devices around the country have already saved 28 newborns. I'm not telling every woman to utilize our baby box. That, that's the last thing I want. But what I want is these babies that are being left in dumpsters and trash cans to have a safe place to fall. Ultimately, the proposed change would allow mothers to decide. It's a very difficult situation for them to, to face that. So if they want to, to keep them anonymous, I think it's a good thing or a good way to do it. The transfer from the mother to the fire department, I think should be a little bit different. More in person, maybe have give it to a person to it's a baby. You know, it's not like an object, I, I feel. With the law changing in Florida when it comes to uh, abortion, uh, what do you expect will happen in the state of Florida? You know, we've never had a time in our history where abortion was uh, not readily available and the safe haven law was. So I, I don't really think any of us know what's going to happen. Guad Venegas is joining us now live from Miami. Have any of these boxes been installed anywhere in Florida, Guad, or what's the status of this? Hallie, Monica told us there is one box in Florida in Ocala. She says that was installed after the mayor himself petitioned the box. She also told us that a baby has been delivered at the box. So she's very glad that it's been installed. And she's also in conversations with four different locations who plan to install a box. In fact, one of those locations, she says she's already decided to move forward. Uh, she also made it clear that this law that is going through the Florida legislature would help fire stations and hospitals would essentially facilitate uh, for them to have these boxes. But the current law does not keep her from installing the boxes. So she does plan to move forward with helping any locations that want one of these baby boxes, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. A Japanese company in Japan says it has lost contact with its spacecraft just seconds before it was supposed to touch down on the moon. Engineers say they're going to have a better idea of what went wrong later but it seems like the mission apparently failed. If it had gone well, it would have been the first private company to pull off a moon landing. Ah, some like semi-disappointed faces there. Over in the UK, Prince William got a, I'm quoting here, a very large sum of money. We're learning in a 2020 phone hacking settlement with Rupert Murdoch's big newspaper publisher there. That's what lawyers for Prince Harry say in new court documents. They're trying to show why Harry's lawsuit against the publisher of The Sun and the News of the World, which no longer exists, should not be thrown out. Murdoch's news group newspapers argues Harry's claims were brought too late, but Harry says he was prevented from bringing a case because of a secret agreement between the royal family and the papers. And in Australia, an American woman was arrested at the airport in Sydney for having this in her luggage. It is a uh, handgun plated in 24 karat gold. Australia has some of the strictest gun laws in the world. If convicted, the woman could face up to 10 years in prison. Still to come here on the show, if you're sniffling or sneezing way more than usual this time of year, you are not alone. Oh, no. My experts say more and more adults are getting allergies for the very first time. Coming up. New research from NBC's medical team out tonight shows if you think you're having allergies for the first time, you are probably right. More and more people in their 30s and 40s and 50s are getting seasonal allergies for the first time ever with symptoms that a lot of us longtime sufferers know well. Sneezing, sniffling, the itchy, itchy, itchy eyes. The new research also shows allergies this year are starting even earlier than they normally would. So why? Why is this happening? Experts say climate change... Blame that, because a warmer winter this year is making things bloom sooner. That means pollen season is longer than it usually is. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. Dr. Natalie, you know this is not news to me, as my team calls them allergies because they are so bad for me. What's interesting is somebody in my household is now getting them for the first time ever, they think. But how is he supposed to know if it's allergies and not just getting sick, right? Like, how is anybody supposed to be able to tell the difference of that? I know. I actually was wondering if you knew that I was trying to tell the difference if I was having an allergy or a cold in the last two days. And I do this little drill to myself, and you're going to do this to your family okay. member, too. Like, if you basically think of a Venn diagram and you have cold symptoms and allergy symptoms, there's going to be some overlap, like, a cough, a runny nose, maybe a little bit of a sore throat. But the number one symptom, Hallie, that will go with allergy that you'll 
really never see with a cold is those itchy eyes, even an mm. itchy nose or an itchy throat. And I think another thing to really keep in mind, if you're suffering now and it's been two weeks, three weeks, that's allergy. A cold is going to last seven to 10 days. And there's also some seasonality. Now, I know people are developing new, um, new allergies for the first time, but like Cold and flu season is in the winter. P p people tend right. to not get um, allergy symptoms so much in the summertime. Talk about the climate connection here, because I think it's interesting, like why it's so bad. We, we talked about how warmer winter means longer pollen season because stuff is blooming earlier. Yeah. I mean, is that the connection here? Is that why so many people are now having first time allergies in their adult lives, even after never having had them before? Well, I mean, that's the main reason, Hallie. You know, the ground is thawing earlier. Trees are going to flower earlier and they're going to start to produce their pollen earlier. And we have seen absolutely a longer season and significantly more pollen than in years past. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is that a lot of people relocated during the pandemic. And if you're moving to a new area, you might be exposed to a new oh. pollen for the first time and never knew that you had an allergy to it before. So then give us some news you can use. Um, yeah. What are people supposed to? I would tell you, I am not recommending this and I know it's probably not good. I take quadruple the dose of allergy medication because they're just so bad. And, it, and like, I, just anecdotally, one, our producer on, a, on our team here, Lauren, she says she takes an allergy pill every day that doesn't do anything. Yeah. What are you supposed to do? I know, I know. And I think like, so that's the last thing on my on my list is for, for people to think about getting allergy shots. But if you're kind of really taking an antihistamine every single solitary day and quadrupling up on the dose, it's probably time to see an allergist and get some allergy okay. shots. Thanks, but, Dr. But, Natalie. You sound like my partner. I don't need to hear it from I everybody know, right? in my life. But. but the one thing that's really important is to reduce exposure. And that is, that means like spending time indoors. Maybe you're not, you know, I love opening the window in the springtime, yes. but that's letting all the pollen in. You got to wash yourself when you come inside and then obviously the neti pot and the antihistamines mm -hmm. um, the nasal rinses nasal sprays all of that stuff uh, can be super super helpful dr natalie azar benefit of having your own show is like personal medical advice from a, yeah, there from you a go. tv expert doctor i appreciate you uh, yes. thank you and thanks uh, i know on behalf of all allergy sufferers everywhere and thanks to all of you for watching, whether you suffer from allergies or not. That's a wrap for this hour and for the one before it. More for you here tomorrow, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now, the top story. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.